What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is certified by the Interior Designers of Canada. He loves to learn and meet new people. He's a creative soul. He is the founder of Decanthropy, an equity design consultancy. He's the president at Interior Designers of Canada, better known to most people as IDC. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ian Rolston. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Dan. Really great to be here. I'm so glad to have you here. And I've said this a couple of times on um, previous, more recent previous podcasts, but I'm getting a lot of these guests like you right now that have come as okay. referrals to previous guests like Dion. Uh -huh. So you found your way to me from Dion and we, she said, oh, you got to talk to Ian. So oh, we talked to each fantastic. other. Yeah, we hit it off. And then we find out that we have like a, a similar path, not in the sense that I'm a designer or running a large international organization, mm -hmm. but um, we, well, you started at Yabu Pushelberg, but then spent uh, a lot of time at Hirsch Bedner, which is where I got yeah. my start as an intern in college. And I think what's amazing is I just was speaking with someone else who started it at um, Yabu Pushelberg. And then if you look at the Yabus, the Hirsch Bedners, right. the Wilsons, the, you know, there's a handful of those really strong uh, hospitality design firms that have launched the careers and oh, inspired absolutely. and impacted so many people. And just from the small sample that I just mentioned right now, right. it's just so awesome to think that whenever I've spoken to any of those principals at those firms, it's there's never, I guess they're a little sad to see these great people leave, but there's also this, um, I wish you well, and all right. of the success and I think it's really a testament to our industry, those firms in particular, yes. um, but also just leaving an impact and make, leaving the world a better place than, than when you were handed it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. I, I think it's one of the things that I most admire about the hospitality industry uh, is that there is a certain degree of hospitality hospitality that is assigned to how we are engaging and, and treating and, and actually supporting and preparing uh, people to, to, do, to, to move on and, and go and do some greater things in the industry. I, I totally agree. And then um, I wonder if you could just, because most are, we have listeners from all over the place, but most of our listeners are from the United States as of now, although we, you know, we've had a bunch more international guests and a lot of listeners as well. Tell right. us a little bit about IDC, what the mission is, and then what your specific, um, what you're championing as the president there now um, in your strategy. Okay, great. So IDC uh, really is the national body for advocating uh, for the profession of interior design in Canada. Uh, so we work closely with our provincial bodies to ensure that we are communicating the, the value of the industry uh, to our wider communities that we're serving. Um, and so we're really focused on, of course, on supporting our membership, making sure that they have access to information, tools and services that help them to do what they do best. Uh, but we also want to ensure that we are sharing why interior design is so unique and so impactful and vital to wider society as we represent a group of problem solvers uh, and storytellers that really enrich the lives of all of those who we're interacting and engaging with. So that's that's really the, the focus uh, that we're looking to stay really focused on this year uh, to engage our members and uh, again, the wider community and industries that we're serving. I love the advocacy for such an important profession and vocation of interior design because you know, oftentimes, the architects get all the glory in, right. in the built environment, right? And, and rightfully so in many cases. Right, right. But if you really think about us small humans going through these massive edifices, yes. it's really the interiors that really lend themselves and enhance whatever life experience is happening within there. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I, I absolutely agree. Um, 
I, I love my architectural cousins, uh, but there's just something about interior design that I think really speaks to the heart, body, mind, and soul of, of end users uh, that provides this real sort of connective tissue to both the community of users and how they're interacting with space. And, you know, there is a, a very sort of distinct way that you approach interiors that is very different from the discipline of architecture. Um, and so I love when uh, these two industries are able to come together and collaborate because it really makes for, for meaningful spaces. And you've become the president of this organization just about two years ago. So either, I don't know the math just yet, but it was the pandemic had just happened or it was about to happen. I think it, we were in the midst of it when you became, correct? Right. Well, I was appointed to the board two years ago and became president uh, last year. Oh, got uh, it. Yeah, yeah, in November. Okay, so with the assumption of, or let's just say with you, let's say with the coronation of a new mm -hmm. executive or chief executive or <laughs> president, right, of any organization. Um, okay, there's all the, we all stand on the shoulders of those before us. And so you're obviously, you're doing Absolutely. all of your advocacy and, and your, and all of the work that had been laid out before you, but with every new executive coming in, there are new passions and new focuses and new strategies that you or they would bring along. Like talk to us about what you're passionate about and, and how you're evolving um, right. IDC. Right. So look, the, I, I wouldn't have the opportunity to be a part of this organization without the original founders and the countless other volunteers and, and presidents uh, and staff members that have served uh, in such a wonderful capacity. So I am most definitely appreciative to the work that has been sort of laid um, and the standard that has been raised. Um, and so from my perspective, coming into the organization, it's really important that we continue to be a connector. Um, and so for me, that sort of really uh, nets out in three, three specific ways. Uh, the first is making sure that we're showing our work and, and making ourselves visible uh, as an organization. Sometimes we know that associations can become a little sleepy or a little insular uh, in terms of we're just sort of serving our, our members and we're doing what we're doing. But it's important for, for us as an organization because I believe interior design is so vital to human life um, that we have to be more open to, again, the communities that we're serving so that they can see what is really at the heart of our, our industry. Uh, and really see the work that our practitioners do that are helping to support uh, their everyday lives. Um, so that's the first uh, step. The, the second step is really making sure that we're understanding our pipeline. Uh, and I really wanna focus on our emerging leaders, um, those that are coming to the profession uh, to ensure that they understand that they are going to be in positions and and roles to innovate what interior design means for the future. And so we want to really meld this idea of uh, experience and energy and make sure that we are creating uh, greater opportunities for growth uh, in the industry, especially from a diversity uh, standpoint. Um, and then lastly, I, I call our last pillar, it's the, uh, the problem to solve. You know, there are so many great human beings that are involved in this industry. And I more and more am referring to designers as problem solvers. And so we need to get out there in our communities uh, and align with other great organizations, community groups and associations, and let's solve some of the issues that we're facing uh, in our communities. Uh, in particular in Canada, we have uh, a housing crisis, uh, of course, in, in many of our cities that I believe designers can lend their experience, uh, their expertise, their skill and acumen to help solving some of these issues. So there are a myriad of social issues that we can become involved with. So with the work that we're focused on this, this uh, year, we're trying to really engage with a community to solve problems. We, we just had an opportunity to work with a, a group of future uh, women leaders uh, with one of our matriarchs here in Canada uh, for diversity um, and inclusion. And it was amazing to work with these, these young women who you know will be running things in the future. 
uh, we got to share with them design thinking and how our processes of, of interior design as interior designers actually help to, to, to solve uh, issues. So we gave them the principles and they created wonderful solutions uh, for the problems that we gave them to solve. So that, that's the focus. You make it sound so simple, three pillars. Okay, yeah. now you can retire, it's all done. It's all done. And I get to have more conversations with people like you. <laughs> um, I want to, I, I love, I love that you have the three pillars, first of all, because I think sometimes we can have so many initiatives that we get blind to really what we're trying to achieve. Um, if you think about, or not even thinking about it, I've already thought about it. So share with us as far as how you're showing your work and how you're making it more visible and serving the member, serving your members and showing the work that you're doing to the community at large. Right. So one, um, let's call it a project that we're engaged with now is making sure that people understand who is involved in the work. Um, and so that means, of course, definitely sharing our staff, but we also want to make those that are on our committee members more visible and share stories about who they are, the work that they're doing, but also to share their difference, difference in practice, difference in ethnicity and approaches to, to work so that our wider community uh, of practice and the communities that we're serving understand that there, there is representation uh, within the organization. And so that sort of goes back to my previous point uh, a little bit where I said that sometimes I think associations can become a little insular. We want to make sure that we're being open uh, to our communities and being more hospitable, uh, really, in the sense of saying, this is who we are uh, and there's a place for you. And storytelling is so important because it, I think it's, it creates this vibration that we can all attach onto. We visualize it. We, it to really connect and hear a story, we have to have empathy towards the storyteller. And we, right. we're basically, it's like a free ride, right? right. We, get to, we get to ride that wave. Absolutely. Um, tell, tell us about like a great example. I'm sure you have so many, but if you could pick an example of an incredible story of diversity that you've gotten out, out there and, and how it's impacted those who've, heard, who've, who've been open to hearing it. Right. Well, I'll share one with you just this week. Uh, we, we did a, a great talk with a group of designers uh, with Decanthropy, uh, the, the company that I founded and the methodologies that I've uh, established uh, to help move conversation around uh, diversity and to shift thinking uh, in the diversity space as to how diversity is really a, a fantastic business approach uh, for companies and organizations. And so we had uh, approximately maybe 109 individuals that we were speaking to. Um, and it's funny when you're in a, a room with people uh, that are sort of tensely sitting on the edge of their, their seats wondering, okay, what is this guy gonna talk to us about? Um, I had a wonderful uh, co-panelist uh, who's an amazing thinker, Yasmin Fadal. Um, she was with me. And so we had an opportunity to unpack approaches to diversity uh, and really share from our experiences how we think really does impact how we're engaging with each other. And that there is one snippet of uh, knowledge that I'm going to share is that we we think differently from culture to culture. Like literally our brains are formed differently. So we see the world differently. And that offers an amazing opportunity when you bring all of this perspective together in one room. And so the, the great sort of outcome from this conversation was that a lot of people, they, were, they saw things much broader and clearer uh, than they did before coming in because we focused on the, approaching this work with one sense of humanity. Uh, and it changes the conversation completely. And if you could generalize about one of those 109 people sitting in that audience who may have been skeptical or unsure about diversity making us stronger, which I firmly believe it does because it's the human experience that makes us stronger. Like what was some feedback that you got from that generally, um, I mean, obviously they weren't so close-minded because they were there, 
but if, right. if like how could how did you change other people's thinking um as an outcome of that right i believe it is that you have to insert yourself into the story um with the canthropy we do some exercises uh with the leaders that we uh, speak to that actually place themselves and their own experiences in the context of difference in the context of um, what could be referred to as otherness uh, so that they could see the world uh, in a different way that they're not accustomed to. And oftentimes it's that connection that you sort of see, you can see it on people's faces where the light just goes on. It's like, oh, I, I get it. Because when I experience that and I know what that feels like to be uh, overlooked, um, treated poorly. Um, I can now understand uh, the perspective in which you're sharing uh, with us. Um, and so it allows for the conversation to flow, I think much more meaningfully and productively. And the outcome inevitably is always this sort of sense of, of inspiration. And that's the expression that we, we hear a lot um, when we are, are working with groups is that they feel inspired uh, and oftentimes unburdened because it's like, oh my gosh, okay, so I'm not a horrible person or I didn't do something wrong. It's just, I didn't understand. And it's, the, it's that key sort of shift in thinking that once understanding is established, uh, it, it's a great foundation to move forward. I think we could all benefit tremendously from that. So if you were to, if an example of a story of having someone feel overlooked and then on one side and then on the other side the person who maybe is never overlooked like how like what was the story and then how did that impact the person who never thought of being overlooked right well i'll give you a generalization because most of these conversations are happening in confidential settings correct general a hundred percent please yeah. be general <laughs> don't throw don't general. throw sally under the bus i i will not but but I'm just kidding. I'm, it wasn't Sally. I just made up the name. If it, it was it, Sally, I, I apologize. It, it wasn't Sally, but we'll, we'll use Sally for an example. Great. Um, uh, Sally had described uh, being overlooked in uh, a, a room of individuals that were of, uh, let's say, uh, homogeneous. Uh, and in that setting, although Sally had an understanding of, of her skill and her talent and what she brought to the conversation, she was being consistently passed over in the discussion. Um, and being able to connect that experience uh, that was really uh, in, in that moment as it was uh, described, sort of disruptive and, and hurtful uh, to Sally, connecting that to uh, the lived stories uh, that I share within the group about different people groups how being overlooked is a universal human experience uh, and feeling. And so once you connect with that and understand uh, how that impacted you, it's much easier to see how that impacts others. So to you, Sally, more, so for being overlooked, um, I'm sure we're all overlooked in some way, shape or form at some point, right? Everyone. Absolutely. Um, and then I could see how, let, so let's just say Sally, who's who's overlooked and maybe she's aware of it in many cases, in some mm -hmm. cases or many, and maybe she's unaware of it in many or some other cases. Um, I think the real challenge of being overlooked is also when you recognize that you are overlooked, how can these types of conversations help with the courage to say, hey, you missed me here. Um, I'd like extra consideration. How do you, so first of all, there's a vulnerability that that person needs to do, oh. which is scary, right? And Absolutely. then it's having the confidence to be like, hey, Sally here, yeah. uh, consider me, consider yeah. this. Yeah. Look, Dan, I, I have a theory that uh, we are all still our four-year-old selves. As we grow up, we just learn how to mask all of those things more and more. So our insecurities, 
uh, or you know, wanting to share our, our hopes and, and, and dreams, all, all those things that really connect us as, as human beings, all those experiences. And so more often than not, whether you're the CEO or, or the project manager, when you're in a room of people, the common thread is, is that everyone has the same issues that you do. Everyone's just trying to hide them all at the same time. So it usually takes an individual that has the ability and the courage, as you say, to exercise the power to say, hey, look, I'm a human being. I don't have it all together. I don't have all the answers, but this is what I do have. What do you have? And if, if you can sort of position the conversation that way, it's almost like letting a, a breath of fresh air just sort of uh, fill the room. Yeah. And then, okay, so making ourselves vulnerable is always difficult. And I, I feel like it's not impo- like it's a muscle, right? right? That we have to keep flexing and, and working out. Um, but oftentimes I think what, obviously what's preventing that courage of saying, Hey, consider me or don't overlook me. There's mm-hmm. a certain, um, there's a courage that's needed to do that, to take that step. And then, so with this group of 109 people or just groups in general, what are great ways that you've seen in a group dynamic to let everyone know that it's okay to be vulnerable and please be courageous and take the step forward. And I have my own ideas, but I'd love to hear hear yours. So ours is really simple. We we simply say it (laughs) At, at every session. We say, look, there are, there's a standard that we have for this this meeting that we're, we're, we're gonna be in, this conversation we're gonna be engaged in. First is honesty, trust and integrity. And so these and transparency, these are the only ways that we can actually have a meaningful conversation. And so we allow people an opportunity to sort of naturally become comfortable through at least finding a way uh, in the conversation where they, they feel that they can uh, contribute. We, we don't beat anyone over the, the head with what they have to do or what they have to say. That's one. The second thing that we say is forget about everything that you've heard. I know that we live in a world that is increasingly polarized. This isn't the point of this conversation. There is no side to be taken. We are a group of human beings that have a perspective that we're gonna share. And I also say that I care about you. And my only expectation is, is that you care about me. And that inevitably just takes all of that anxiety, all of that fear out of the room, because now we know that we're having a human conversation. It's really like, and then if you, if you look at all that, okay, so some, I hear you say all that, but there's still times where I'm like, and I see others and I know others, because I talk to a lot of people where there's just that fear, right? You're being held down by this fear. And then there's this bubble of like, just some kind of a bubble that's kind of repelling you from entering that kind of safe place. Right. But it's really, as much as we say, hey, trust and respect and be vulnerable and be courageous, sometimes it's still really difficult for people. But I, you know, t- hearing you say honesty, trust, integrity, and transparency, I, uh, what I think I heard you say is the ultimate outcome of all of that is that everyone should feel comfortable, right? Absolutely. Which is then a great transition to like the real point of this podcast, which is like, given all that and your experience designing the built environment in hospitality and now all the initiatives you're doing now, like how do you define hospitality? Oh, I, I believe hospitality is a great opportunity to serve humanity uh, with, without question. Um, and we know this because we, we've seen hospitality is hospitality. It, it is present in every culture, in every people group on the planet. Uh, there are uh, traditions, norms, uh, expectations, all associated with this idea of expressing care for someone who you want to uh, entertain, someone you want to uh, nourish. Uh, it, it, these things are, are universal. And so it's, it's this, this understanding of, of service and serving humanity uh, that I think one really inspired inspired me when I began to understand really what was at the heart of of hospitality or at least the potential of of hospitality, not not just as a business, but also as a connector. Um, 
And so we've seen the evolution from, uh, you know, hotels are, are no longer uh, a place where you, you know, get a good night rest or, or have a good meal, but they really do represent uh, an ability to, to connect uh, across the spectrum of human difference uh, and offer experiences. And, and I know we've moved from the experience phase into the transformation phase of hospitality. Um, and I think, I think as, as our industry continues to move forward, that these connections are, are gonna become really the foundational um, sort of distinction in those experiences and in those transformations. Uh, for, for brands uh, all across the board. I completely agree with you. And I think that's a great segue into your second pillar, which I haven't forgotten about because we went over the first <laughs> one, which is just showing people like what you're doing and how you're impacting. But the second one was just your pipeline and right. inspiring, connecting, um, introducing people to this fabulous industry and really like showing them the humanity that comes through the design and the work. So how are you, because everyone's having pipeline challenges from a talent perspective right now, at right. least in the, in the United States, I'm sure it's the same up in Canada, but like how, how are you understanding your pipeline better and connecting with it better? Right, so we are asking questions of our emerging professionals, our, our students. Um, you know, we have, I'm gonna be really candid with you. We are scaring <laughs> a generation of potential emerging leaders in our industry because they are seeing what success, quote unquote, looks like as a practitioner in terms of I'm working 90 hours. Um, I've completely forsaking everything else. I'm focused on, on my job and my, my job alone. I'm driving profits. And our generation is looking at us and <laughs> they're thinking, hmm, maybe not so much because I want other experiences in my life. And so I think for us as an industry, uh, we're going to have to address sort of the, the, the measures and the metrics that we've created uh, that define what a successful designer uh, does, what a successful designer looks like and what successful uh, firms, uh, how they conduct business, uh, in order to meet, uh, I think, the, the changing needs and expectations of, of our future leaders. And, and that has to happen, of course, through mentorship. But we also have to be intentional as an industry to recognize that there's a generational uh, shift that is taking place. And it's, it's not to say one generation uh, should be accommodated more than the other. But I think there's an opportunity that we're missing to understand the, the value of the cross-pollination of ideas and supports that actually are made possible by allowing a, a generational approach to how we're protecting for the future of our industry. Well, you said two things that really resonated with me there. One was sc scaring. We're scaring an incoming generation. So there's a fear. There's a and fear. then metrics and measurables. I love fear because it's often a great teacher, right? It's really scary, right. obviously, but Trial by that, terror. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the same way in that idea when you were speaking about making yourself vulnerable and it's that fear, there's, there's oftentimes it's a great, it's intuition, it's, it's feeling, it's empathy, but it's, it's telling us something, right? So right. how are you taking that fear that newcomers may have and then how are you measuring the change? Like what, what are the metrics? Uh, I know you said mentorship and just this idea of a generational shift, but like, how are you measuring it? Right. Well, well first, let me, let me talk a little bit about the, the, the fear component. We, we have to shift the fear component um, from a more sort of um, what we think now is, is fear is you're, you're sort of more fear of the repercussions of the action or not measuring up or not doing. And, and so I talk a lot to, to students about just embracing the process of failure because failing is, is it's, it's, it's a great tool um, in order for you to test ideas, to shift uh, courses, to learn how to do that quickly, to understand what's working or what's not. Um, it's that sort of minimal viable product uh, approach. 
And so we have to define, redefine what fear is and really embrace uh, failing and failing fast <laughs> and hard and being okay with it and getting up in and doing it again. Um, and so the, the metrics I think for, for doing this need to be sort of measured more so in how we are collaborating uh, with individuals. If you have a group that is sharing openly, uh, feeling like they are contributing, even if th those ideas may not be uh, landing, but that there's this open dialogue and exchange uh, where people feel like they belong and they're a part of the process. Um, the other metric I, I, I try to uh, land politely and softly uh, with groups is that you, you have to be able to look around and ensure that those that you are collaborating with are not all like you. We have to, even if you have to engage in uh, bringing other groups in that are even totally different from the industry that you're participating in, you gotta go out and reach out to some folks and bring them into the tent and, and have some conversations. So recently, I don't know if you heard this one, but I had a Eileen Koo, who's the CEO of the Opportunity Network in New York. It's an organization I really right. believe strongly in. Absolutely. And this isn't their tenant, but it, I don't know who said this, but it really resonated with me and helped me really want to get more involved with them. But it it's the idea that talent is uniformly distributed amongst humanity, right. but opportunity is not. Absolutely. So, and I think it's all of our duties to really help extend opportunities to those that might not have it. And it's not because they're not good or they're, they're, they're from somewhere else. It's just because many people don't know how to leverage their own personal networks right? Um, or they only use it for themselves. And I think that in me talking to you right now, or if I'm talking to anyone, if I'm talking to you or someone else, whoever I'm right. talking to at this moment is a gateway to a whole nother world. Absolutely. Right. And your whole life experience to where to this point where we're speaking right now, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of conversations and connections that you've had. Right. And 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 it's the same, and it, and it's reciprocal, right, right? Right. So it's really how do we shorten other people's journeys through leveraging our networks to help shorten their journeys? You know, it's absolutely and, and I think that we could all benefit from that level of sharing. Yeah, I, I think even to connect back to this idea of hospitality, hospitality is sharing. And so as we are um, practicing within this industry, we have to really represent uh, some of those tenants. Uh, so being open and, and sharing and considerate. Uh, these are things that we, I believe as practitioners need to continue to model, uh, whether it's with a potential client or with a student or you know, someone that you've struck up a conversation with uh, at the airport uh, on your way to the next, your next meeting, right? We, we do represent a sense of humanity that goes beyond uh, the work that we're producing. 100%. And it's also, you know, I love that conversation with the, with the person at the airport or in passing. Right. You know, these, we're all on our phones, we're all on our devices, we're all doing this stuff. And it just upsets me so much that as we're all looking at our palms or whatever mm -hmm. we're holding, we're missing out on that opportunity for connection. And it really pisses me off. Like I try my hardest to put it down and talk to people. And my kids think it's always weird that I'm talking to random right. people all over the place. <laughs> but like, I don't know. I just love hearing people's stories. And I think we can all learn from everyone surrounding us. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing how, you know, we had talked about fear. We, we have to challenge ourselves. I think it's part of our human experience to get out of our comfort zone. Uh, and even in the course of your day, even if it's for 15 minutes to say, I'm not going to look at this thing, this box, but I'm actually going to do something that I don't typically do and be intentional of, about that. Uh, I think we can all agree that there are probably areas in our lives where we need to be more intentional about how we're engaging uh, with others. And so I, I was actually struck this past year, I had an opportunity to speak to uh, Chief Joseph Roberts, 
who was one of the chief architects of the uh, reconciliation um, reform here in, in Canada with our uh, wonderful uh, Indigenous uh, communities. And he actually outlined this, this idea of reconciliation as a lifestyle uh, that struck me deeply. Um, and we're, we're, we're looking more at how do we actually make sure that this idea of reconciliation is a part of our interactions in every moment of, of every day in the most simplest ways of expressing you know, kindness or acknowledging uh, or, or sharing or letting someone maybe cut in line uh, before you in, in very like simple ways. It doesn't have to be these sort of huge uh, gestures, but how do we keep this uh, front of mind so that we are affirming uh, our sense of humanity uh, in others, but also in ourselves as well? Okay, that's super interesting. So give me an example as uh, Justice Roberts, it's Justice Roberts? Chief, Chief. Chief Roberts, Chief, right. Chief Roberts. Like, okay, so when I think of reconciliation, I hear the big reconciliation, right? right? And what I'm hearing you say is it doesn't have to be the big one, it could be the little one. So I got my head around the big one. The big one to right. me is Rwandan genocide. They had this incredible and painful truth and reconciliation process where they laid it all out there as a community, as a nation, as tribes, as everything, right. and just got it all out. There was no misunderstanding. There was no inferring. It was just all there, right? Mm -hmm. I look at, at the United States and I say, okay, the Civil War was over in uh, 1865 right 1868 i forget what year exactly and i don't think we ever really did the whole big reconciliation thing and i feel like it's created all these other problems and inferences 160 years later however my right. math is not good right now so i i see the good and i see the missed opportunities right on a big scale how do you do like walk me through reconciliation on on like a small scale i, I can tell you just this this morning, uh, my, my wife and I had a misunderstanding. And it all it took was me to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I, I, that's not what I intended. But I, this is what I do want. And to the want affirmed her sense of humanity. And that was it. it we, we were good again. It just took you know, not focusing on sort of getting caught up in my own feelings about the, the situation to say, hey, wait, no, I want you to be good. I'm sorry. This is what I want. This is what I, this is what I wanted. This is what I intended. Mm -hmm. Just small moments. There was a, another one with, um, and I'll use my family because I've been hanging out with my family for a, a lot as many of us have been. Uh, you know, my son wasn't having the, the greatest day. I, I had a, a, a box of uh, lollipops. Um, I just gave him and say, hey, you know, tear up, have a lollipop. That's all it took to change his mood. So mm -hmm. we, we can do these small acts that can have a big impact on, on the people uh, that are around us. I totally get it now. Okay. So actually to make it personally for me, I had a, an instance like that uh, over a year ago where mm -hmm. I was on a call and it didn't go well. Um, and it turns out after the fact, I heard that the person I was speaking with thought right. that I was mansplaining to them. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which I was like, and, and it killed me for like a year. And I haven't been able to see anyone and all this. And then, right. and, and kind of set it straight. I, I bumped into that person a couple of times and I just couldn't, it was never appropriate to like bring up that situation. Right. And, um, and then I saw them recently. And I said, listen, I just, and I made sure no one else was around. I just said, I got to like talk about this with you. And I right. said, I am sure that you heard what you heard. So I don't want to discount that. Right. And you heard it the way that you heard it. That you heard it. But I need you to know that that was a hundred million percent, not my intention. Right. And I said to her, I said to uh, them, I said, you know, thank you so much for for making this an issue because I feel like we're all, we all exist and we all live in these jars, if you will. Right. 
and we can't read the label on the jars that we're in. And okay. sometimes we need help reading our labels. And the only way you Absolutely. can do that is from an outside thing. In this case, it's more often than not, it's a misunderstanding. It's that blind spot that we yeah. might have. Yeah. And so at the end, I just, I, I thanked them. I said, thank you so much, but it's been really killing me. And I just wanted to set it right. So I guess that that was a reconciliation in some way. Absolutely. So I'm, ex I'm, I'm ex accepting my fault and my role in whatever the misunderstanding is and right. understanding that, that there could have been a misunderstanding right. and then just not expecting any kind of different outcome, but just, I just got to clear the air with you and Hey. Yeah, absolutely. I, I say that we, we don't have to be right or we don't have to agree, but we have to be human beings. Mm -hmm. That that's the standard. <laughs> but with my right. kids, I'm always right. That's well, what we have to understand. Parents get exempted from this law. <laughs> <laughs> and then our kids will resent us and hate us when they're older. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, okay. Well, that's awesome. I, I got to read more about Chief Roberts. Chief Roberts. Yeah. Hmm. Mini micro reconciliations or mini reconciliations. I think that's really important. Yeah, it's laying it out, being vulnerable, and bridging the gap. I guess closing Absolutely. the closing the space. Yeah, huh? Definitely. All right, and and you can something. imagine applying applying that principle to some of the things that ail us in our wider society. We we have to understand that you know issues of of, of race and discrimination and equity. These are all difficult topics that we are not going to solve uh, in the matter of uh, months or, or years, but we have to stay committed to the exchange of, of humanity and understanding the disruption uh, that, that these ideas uh, and that this, this history has heaped on us uh, and to grapple with it in, in a way that really promotes understanding um, and seeks for a way forward with, without disparaging uh and any anyone um well it comes back to that trust and respect right correct and feeling comfortable and actually that's probably really pillar number three which is problem solving mm -hmm. so as as the leader of idc what on the third pillar like where are you spending most of your time um solving problems and i also love how you said that design is really just solving problems. And oh, absolutely. so before you answer third pillar, I always did art growing up. I painted, I drew, I was really, I loved it. You know, I got into some really cool art and design schools, Not, right. but as, as a artist, as someone who was drawing and painting and just making stuff. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I was maybe before my senior year of high school, I did an architecture program at Cornell. Oh, Excuse and, me. Yeah, well, it was just like, a, it was all a bunch of high schoolers from all over the place that came in. It was really cool. Right. Um, and, you know, the first thing was like, hey, build a cube out of Strathmore and draw it. Build right. a, and then it was like, pick a word. I think I chose fragmentation. There were all these ad, um, different adjectives or ad, right, ad, right. Ad, um, that were on a page. Right. And then it was like, okay, make a, a plane or a surface. And then you had to fuse them together physically in model and then also drawing them. Right. And then describe it. And that was after years and years and years of doing art, that was the first time I'd ever encountered design, which was yeah. taking an idea and creating something and solving for a problem, right? right. And I think that, does, so we teach art in school, we teach music, we teach science, math, you know, English or whatever language writing, um, but we don't teach design. And right. that's, crazy in a way we do like okay you're going to write a paper on whatever subject you're you're learning you kind of have to think about a thesis explain it and yep. you're designing an argument yes. yeah but it's not really taught as the idea of design right so i guess coming back to the third pillar how are you solving that how are you how what, what are the big problems you're solving so it's it's interesting that you started with the uh, sharing of your art experience. So when I was in high school, I had a art teacher 
Mr. Uh, John Doyle, that absolutely changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, and he taught me in painting to focus on like the little shapes. Don't get overwhelmed by the, the big picture yet. You got to just focus on the, the shapes that you're trying to articulate. And those shapes accumulatively will create your canvas. Uh, and then you just uh, from there. And so I, I've sort of taken that to heart in, in terms of how I approach uh, problem solving and, and how I, I like to help groups uh, problem solve. And we have to focus on particular areas because there are too many problems uh, when we look at our, our society that we, we need to solve. But we can understand that we have tools at our disposal, um, understand what's at hand that you can use, and then go and connect with someone who's actually actively out there, boots on the ground, doing the work, and really determined to support them. So right now we're looking at various community groups that are looking to solve uh, the housing crisis issue uh, in many communities, um, uh, both across the wider communities and underrepresented communities in, in Canada. And we're seeking to lend our, our support uh, to them, uh, both financially, but also with the, the skill and experience of our members to sort of be additional uh, boots on the ground to, to help sort of support their initiatives. So, so that's just one, one example of how focusing on one area uh, and connecting to a, a group that already uh, is entrenched in, the, in solving the problem and lending our support uh, will help expedite uh, and, and really uh, augment their, their, their approach to, to addressing the issues. Okay, so on the housing crisis, um, if you were to break it down like, you're, like your teacher, Mr. Doyle, was it Doyle? Yes. Like Mr. he Doyle. said, Mr. John I, I'm, okay, so we all have great teachers. I had Alice Stanky. <laughs> And uh, Ann Garris, Ann Garris, I think, re re passed away within the past year. But oh, those two, um, ugh, they just really changed my life in so many ways. And um, I think about Alice Stenke mm -hmm. every time I listen to the talking heads, because from sixth grade onward, whenever I had her as a teacher, she would always be playing the talking heads. And it right. just it's like this soundtrack that I love listening to when I paint or draw or just right. actually do anything. Right. Um, but it's amazing those pivotal um, teachers that we all have. I'm but going back to, you. yeah, well, going back to Mr. Doyle, if you look at the housing crisis, what are the little shapes that you're seeing from these experts that you're partnering with? How, how are they breaking it down into the little shapes? Yeah, I, I think the, the big one is access. Um, we have a challenge with accessing um, both opportunity and physical space uh, for building uh, a diversity of housing types that would meet the need. Uh, and so there's some challenges, of course, with our zoning laws, um, but there is also a huge affordability issue um, and the gap between uh, communities that can afford uh, to participate within our industry uh, and those that cannot. And right now, the, the shortage in, in, in housing has created such disparity in affordability that it, is, it seems nearly impossible uh, that if you are not able to purchase a home for a million dollars, that you will not have a home. Yeah. Um, and so we have to work uh, across so many industry sectors in order to address this issue and, and to unlock the, the gridlock that is um, that is in place. The other challenge uh, that some groups, we, we haven't been specifically involved in this, but we understand because housing has become such a commodity uh, that it has driven prices uh, in, a, in a place where we're, we're moving away from housing being a, a basic human right to housing being a product that is to be sold, uh, of course, to the highest bidder for the maximum profit. So we have to balance out uh, both needs of the industry uh, and how those needs serve our communities because housing provides a need. Uh, we, we can't refute that. Uh, we know it is a fantastic business uh, with real estate and it supports the economies, but we have to find a balance so that we're, we're not uh, creating, um, let's just call it dis devastation or destruction for a group of people. 
uh, because we're serving one entity over the other. I totally agree. And to me, I think there's two, you mentioned zoning. And I think there's two things, zoning and also this incredibly fast run up of short term rentals, which is, it's basically show, showing that there's an inelastic supply of housing. Like there's a, and, and I think a quick way to do it is we've got to look at the short term rental thing, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, density yep. is like a surefire way to fix it because you're just adding a lot more units and density in so many different ways. I believe I'm not an expert. I have no idea, but like it, when you have density, you have public transportation, you have, you're building really tight knit communities from environmentally, it checks all the boxes. Right. And I just feel like the, on the zoning side, once you get into to the realm of zoning, it becomes a political thing. And then there's all of this, like everyone's looking out for their own best interests and everything else as on the development side, but not necessarily for, for the people. Right. And, and, and really that, that is the challenge. We, we've been talking so much about empathy um, and empathy without will to change really doesn't, it doesn't do a whole lot then uh, mm. really at the essence of it. it. It is, you know, a great sort of human uh, expression, but we have to move beyond just having empathy, but we have to have the will to make change uh, visible and apparent and real for, for individuals and people groups that, that need this. Um, and so, it, like I, I said, we're going to have to leverage so many uh, levers of, of government and industry and community groups because the, even the diversity of those entities uh, coming together and solving this problem uh, really will impact the future generations uh, exponentially. Uh, so it's, it's going to take uh, a Herculean effort um, and a diverse approach, an inclusive uh, approach uh, to unlocking uh, and solving for this, this, this crisis, in particular in, in Canada. Yeah, especially in Alberta when oil is over $100 a barrel and then you get these little houses out in the middle of nowhere for more than a million dollars. It's crazy. Right. It's insane. It's 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 hard to watch and it's hard to fathom. Even as, as a father, when you know you sort of think of your your kids, what what are you, what is that? What is the market going to look like when you're looking uh, to get into it uh, and raise a family and do all those things? Um, so you 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 wonder um, not only for my kids but also kids in 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 other communities uh, that we say you are to dream. Uh, you are to have ap uh, aspirations, um, but we still uphold uh, these, these barriers uh, that present themselves uh, while they're dreaming and while they're aspiring that, that really do undermine the, the dreams and the, the aspirations. So we've got to look at the systems uh, that are in place for sure. Well, I hope you figure it out because hopefully we can apply that in other places. Although even if you figure it out in Canada, you know, the next big fear is that the United States is going to steal all your water. So even if you have a place where to live, you're not going to have any water because we're going to take it all. Well, this is true. So keep your hands off our water, Dan. We'll, we'll come get you. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> ours come from a well, not from the Great Lakes. So we're all right. good. But um, that's a joke. It's a weird conspiracy theory that I just, I think there was a really bad B movie that was made a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, about it as well and I think I saw it on an airplane I was like and I oh, as soon as I landed I called some friends in Toronto I was like is this a thing and then they're like yeah I have so many friends that think that there's all these <laughs> legal battles going on now and the whole outcome is about taking the taking water from Canada right anyway <laughs> it just makes me laugh um okay, okay so we well. got your three pillars your salt and I, I truly do wish you a ton of success um, oh, on you. the problem solving and teaching for design. But if you think about um, kind of where you are, you're you're nearly two. You're in your second year, right? You're in your second year as president of IDC. Um, well, second what, year on the board, first year as president. First year, so you're right, right. you're going to be going into your second year shortly. Well, so we'll see. Where it's it's for I'm installed for the first year. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll 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 have a, the members will will vote in i believe october no, november okay oh, if i was um, a member i'd vote for you so there we go you're, thank you're, you sir 
but I'm I not. I, I'm it. not Canadian, so I can't. <laughs> but if I could, I'll, in, I'll I'll do an influence campaign for you. <laughs> okay, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So you're in your first year, um, right. and with that, and kind of these three pillars that we've discussed at length. What's mm-hmm. exciting you most about the future? So I, I think there is uh, an understanding um, that we. We're at a place in our 50th history where the world has changed. Uh, And so we have an opportunity to rediscover and redefine sort of what design is going to mean going forward uh, in the future. Um, And I do think that that means understanding that we have uh, a responsibility to be connectors uh, with others within the industry uh, to sort of tell a story that we may have maybe overlooked um, in the past. And it moves beyond uh, sort of the regulatory uh, sort of aspects of design, but I don't really think people understand how critical design, like we we were talking to a group of of kids as I I mentioned, and one of the questions we asked them is, is what is design? And, you know, they have fantastic answers. And and I I tell them that it's a way of problem solving, but but where is design? And just to see them start pointing out, you know, a wall, the floor, the chair, like everything that we interact with in our physical world is design. And so I think that affords us an, an awesome opportunity as an industry to really share that with communities outside of the A and D community to say, hey, we can improve your life. We know how. Uh, and it's it's a, a a critical industry to our sense of well-being moving forward as let's just say as as humanity. Mm-hmm. Well, I love it. Um, okay, so one more question. So if you uh, go back to the Ian of May of two thousand, mm-hmm. you're just starting at Yabu Pusherberg on your your career journey. Right. So you enter a time is a time machine. You're back there. <laughs> you see yourself sitting at the desk. Probably there might have been a computer, but it might have been a drafting table. Did you have a computer then? It, I, we had both actually. Oh, good. So you were still drawing and, still drawing. and a computer. Okay, good. Right. So you you walk up to your younger self there, Ian. What advice do you give yourself? Oh goodness. <laughs> Oh, there's so many ways I can answer this question. (laughs) Okay, so I I would say, I would say pace yourself. Um, Because in this industry, it requires uh, an immense uh, amount of focus uh, to do what you do well, um, and that you don't have an infinite amount of energy. And so you have to be very strategic about how you are going to deploy your resources and your energy in really achieving some of your your, your goals and supporting uh, your employer and supporting uh, your clients, definitely. I love it. Energy is, and energy maintenance and restoration for me personally is something that I struggle with a lot and I'm always tinkering and you know, we get to that place where we're in that flow. Mm -hmm. I used to do it a lot, then I lost my way. Now it's coming back a bit, but it really takes a lot of effort to to pace and get to that flow to where we're nourishing and restoring. So I, oh my God, if I could figure out a way to do that from when I was younger, that would be amazing. I'm telling you. (laughs) (laughs) I would have so much more energy right now. Yeah. Well, the kids take that all that away. So, well, this is true. <laughs> um, so Ian, this has been awesome. How do people connect with you? So they can check me out uh, on our website, decanthropy.com and connect with me via email. I love to chat and love to, to meet new folks. Wonderful. Um, so I just want to, Ian, I want to say thank you so much. This has been a really enjoyable and kind of informative or not kind of very informative conversation so i just thank you for your time and and your efforts here no i and i appreciate you um i don't think i've ever had an opportunity to sort of engage with someone so easily as you know we just started talking um you're a fantastic human being man so I, i just wish you all the best and thank you for even inviting me on 
uh, to, to chop it up with you for a minute. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Now you're making me blush. And, <laughs> and, and thank you to Dion for actually put making yes. that connection, right? Absolutely. That's Dion's amazing. So like she, she knew that this would be a great conversation. Yes. Wow. Okay. She's special. We got to send her some flowers or chocolates. Definitely. Maybe All right, chocolates. <laughs> All right. Send her. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me as I cough, but uh, also Im really important. I, I just want to thank our listeners. I hope this talk has evolved your feeling on hospitality and design in the built environment. And if it has shortened your journey towards a better understanding of both of those things, please share the podcast with others. We're growing and growing and it's all by word of mouth and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.